All right, what's up, everybody? Purple Couch, Purple Gems. I'm here with my motherfucking boy. Uh, we're downtown, so you're going to hear sirens. You're going to hear planes. You might even hear some crackheads yelling off in the distance. Which is oh. nuts, because we're at a pretty decent location, but that'll happen. That'll happen, even here. Um, this is my boy right here, Jason. Jason Yo. Rowland. Jason's been around the motherfucking block, and I thought... It would be good to bring him on so we can get some of his knowledge, knowledge bombs, the gems, if you will. Um, my boy has worked on a lot of projects. Jason, why don't you tell the, the public what you've worked on? I mean, projects I started on, I mean, I started out working with like George Lucas doing stuff for Robot Combat League, which never really made the screen because we went way over budget. But it was George Lucas's uh, passion project. He had something where he wanted to do a, a robots with his daughter. And I started out in art department. And I guess that's kind of where I should probably start my story, honestly, is, is I came into Hollywood because I have a construction background. I've built a lot of things. I've made lots of houses, vehicles, like whatever, you name it. I've been a painter that kind of stuff. I, I, I was in the military. I've, I've done everything. To, I've, I was a private eye at one time. Like, you were a PI. Yeah, legit. I, I was I, a, I was that a, I did not know. I was an undercover private investigator for a place that, that got diamonds in town, you know, or in, in state. And they were losing lots of money because of that or not because of that because they were had people inside that were stealing essentially so my job was to be an undercover investigator to go in and find out you know who was doing it you know make friends with people and and just be a nice guy and just eventually people would give secrets away and then you you knew who did it like and, and you know long story short like i you know found out who did it and that was uh end of that story because I left I was like this is too intense it was literally because you have to make friends with people and, and I'm a genuine person and so you had a hard time with that yeah whole. because because at the end I literally came out to people that weren't involved and told them like I had already quit and came out like took them I told them you know hey last day on the job let's go get some pizza or some shit like that and I told them I was like hey man I've been undercover this whole time I've been watching you guys. I write reports about you guys every night. Everything you say to me, I have to write that down. And I'm just too genuine a person to have to, like, hold that back from someone. Like, they yeah. they weren't in trouble, but they should know. Yeah. You know? Be a genuine person, number one. <laughs> and so you had to, you had to kind of get out of that because it was obviously, like, it, yeah. it was wearing on you the fact that you kind of, that's why I'm not an actor. I'm. I have right. to be a genuine person. Like, <laughs> you know me. They they call me the salty grip. For those who don't know, I am the salty yeah, grip. That, 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 the, that right there. That's the Morton salt. Yeah, lady. yeah. So I mean, and I didn't give myself that name. Uh, production did that. You know what's funny about that, bro? When I, when, we first worked on a project, um. I didn't even see that fucking tattoo, nor did I see your your IG handle. And I was like, you were kind of like just giving me game. <laughs> and it was like after a shoot, after a long fucking hard shoot. And uh, I was like, yeah, bro, you're, you're salty, bro, in a good way. <laughs> and you were like, oh, yeah? And you fucking pull out this tat, and it's it's the salt lady. And I was like, bruh, there it is. And then I saw that your fucking name on IG was Salty Grip. So it all just kind of came together perfectly. Yeah, I mean, but, that, that's, uh, they call me Salty because I don't take any shit. Like, that's what I mean by that. I, I literally won't take shit from anybody. Like, I've been an, around the block enough to understand. Again, it goes with being a genuine person. Be a genuine person. Facts are facts and, and lies are lies. Like, when you, you have the facts on your side... You can be a genuine person, and you don't have to be a dick about it. If you have to lie about something, you're being a dick, you know? I like that. Being a dick about it. Being on set when people are being a dick about it. 
It, it happens. It happens. It happens. Because they, they, you know, people put out there that they know more than they know, or they, they, they state facts that aren't true. You know, they're, they're definitely not. They're like, you can do this. You can, you can, I've seen this happen before on set, which might be a fact that they've seen somebody do that on set before, but you you can look at it and tell it's not safe. And that's, for, that's another, that's number two. If you can look at it and tell it's not safe, it's probably not safe. Like, and that, that's, those are, those are, you know, you can get reassurances from somebody. If the guy, your key grip looks you in the eye and gives you a solid, like, nah, bro, they ain't going nowhere. Like, that's a, that's a solid statement. But if your key grip looks at you and goes, it's good, you know. You know, yeah, he's squirrely about it. Like, that's not safe. Like, so, so th- that's one thing I actually didn't know for a little bit being on set. Um, the safety responsibilities that a key grip has, you know, similar to an AD. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that it was also your responsibility, you know, to kind of adhere to the safety of the set. I mean, key grip has a lot of responsibilities on set. I don't think a lot of people understand uh, grip starts out in camera department. You know, you look it up on IMDb and you'll see grips under camera. Yeah, the key grip has a lot of roles and there's a lot of things you got to consider. And a lot of people don't consider that, you know, outside of just shaping light, they're in charge of the safety aspect because, you know, the best definition for a key grip is somebody who has to build a permanently indefinite structure. And that's a that's definite, definition. That's a definition. I have to build a permanent indefinite structure that has to be able to put up very fast and be able to take it down just as fast. Indefinite. Inde- yeah, it needs to be able to stay up there for a month, two months, three months, but it also n- can't be permanent. Because you got to break that shit down. Yeah. It, uh, uh, after it, the it, after the shot. So even. so yeah, the idea is is that if it has to be up for two three days, it should be able to stand for two or three days and and without any safety concerns you know we'll, we'll go through and check things bolts lines stuff like that just to make sure everything's cool but like that structure should stand like whatever like truss rigging you're putting up or anything like that uh, uh there are, there are things that that don't have that nature like uh our lighting overhead lighting for like outside when we're uh, doing giant crane rigs and stuff like that or big 20 by fly swatters, which I can explain in a second. Uh, but th- those are things that you have to take down because those are wind factors. Like right. when we're gone in the middle of the night, it might blow down. Wow. Yeah, and so we, we take things down that, and again, safety. You know, we look out for safety on set and that's where you have to start the, a lot of times producers will cut corners for safety and, and lieu of time they go no no don't worry about that or uh, a dp might tell you to do something that might be unsafe you know in in lieu of time and and sometimes you you have to sit them down and go look at that's not safe and i I, i'm willing to do what you need to do but i'm not willing to do it unsafe because that comes at the the detriment of you know the production and possibly you know other people could fuck somebody look up. man uh, again i'm the salty grip i don't give a fuck you get your shot off i don't give a fuck you make your day i get paid either way i'm gonna get paid regardless okay you know sometimes that just means that's a pickup day baby fuck it you <laughs> know up, i just get another payday like i'm gonna do my job regardless you know i'm gonna i'm not trying to stop the shoot i'm not trying to slow the shoot down I, matter of fact, me and my boys, we try to make it as efficient as possible so that we can get the shots off. You know, we get the shots done early. A lot of times they're like, shit, like, well, there's nothing else to shoot. Like, let's go home. You don't have to do the full day. You know, there's there's a shot list made. You know, there's only so many actors on set that they have for the day. And if you, you got it all done, I mean, they might create a few extra shots for you to do, but they might go, fuck it, we're done today. Great, great day, guys. You know, and that's all because you're able to move at a pace in in harmony with everybody on set, you know, and everybody asks who's who's the most important person on set. And if anybody says a position, they're wrong. They're 100 percent. Absolutely. 
because everybody's just a, a PA is just as important as the producer, as the director, as the DP, as the key grip. Like all these people play important roles, especially on larger sets. You know, there's some sets where you're beyond this five man shoot and it's small. You know, you can you can get stuff done. You, you don't have an issue trying to, to work like getting things shot. It, it's but those are family shoots. Think about that now. Family shoots. Family shoots. Which is, you know. A, family style. Good old family style. Yeah, family style. But family style is one of those things you, you have to know your boys. you got to work well with them. They have to work well with you. Tension has to be very low. Even though tensions can get high during the situation, everybody knows, like, hey, you know, Mike over there is getting a little flustered. Like, let's not, not jab at him so much, you know, because <laughs> we all jab at each other on set. That's just a normal thing. And we're all trying to have a fun during our shoot. But you know, th there's times when guys get a little like, and you're like, all right, maybe you know, just just maybe offer him a beer for the end of the day. Instead yeah, of, like, we'll we'll back, call him we'll, a pussy. We'll, we'll back <laughs> we'll back off a little bit from him today. Yeah. You know? But you know, there, there's a lot of times where you have uh, uh, people that think it's a friends and family shoot, and it's not. You you've invited people in on a very small shoot, and they expect a lot out of you. And sometimes you have to draw the line, you know, like, I don't know you like that, man. Like, yeah, it's a six man shoot, but I'm drawing the line at how hard I'm going to bust my ass to get your shot done. Like, I, I, I don't mind. Like, it, it's almost I equate sometimes with like friends and family shoots is is like coming over to help your, your friend do his brake job or an oil change or you know what I mean? Like help build a fence or some shit like that. You're not asking to get paid on that crap. Like if, if you you. you are a true friend and your buddy needs a brake job done and needs somebody to pump the pedal to fucking bleed the brakes you come over and you're gonna pump the pedal to bleed the brakes you know what i mean same thing goes to film industry but a lot of times these guys are more generous than that and they like to give you know that's the other thing find generous people in this and, and genuine generous people that are willing to not only help sometimes they sacrifice sometimes they you know but they might not always be you know your best friend at the moment we were talking about that a little while ago Absolutely. undisclosed person we won't uh, mention any names but you know we've had a lot of uh, ups and downs in our our professional relationship that makes it so you know we've grown together that's for sure you know and, and when you see somebody grow you you know walk away from that like that's uh, uh networking in our industry is probably one of the most important things that you can do absolutely you know that gem uh, right there i'm telling you bro the the single i say this to fucking everybody i meet bro the single most important thing that i've done in, in my career to move my career forward and what i would suggest every single person to do is is to network yeah it's to meet people. Go and when it's you know at the end of the day when they say, "Hey, you want to go grab a beer? You want to go get some dinner? Hey, uh, what are you doing this weekend? Yeah. If you're if you're free, do it." Yeah, bro. And, and 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 also the too, fish can wait. The cat can wait. Yes. You know. And also too is is when you do build when you build these connections, build a genuine connection. Yeah be authentic yeah you know don't, don't don't like just like right out the people. yeah don't be fake don't right out the gate be like yo can you do this for me can you get me this can you do that like <laughs> because it's 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 kind of like there can be some some sharky kind of people in this industry at times yeah and so when it, when it comes to like building a genuine connection those those seem to seem to what's the word they, they pack a little bit more of a punch you know they have more value well that's why it's friends and family you know you you have friends and family there's friends and then there's family there's there's people in this industry i genuinely consider family you know absolutely and that wasn't the same in like other industries that i worked in i work in probably 15 or 16 different industries until I landed on a, a career something that I truly liked and uh, 
I have to say that if you don't like what you're doing, if you don't like shooting in the film industry, if you don't enjoy your day to day, it's not for you. You know, it's like being that barista or the Taco Bell dude, or I mean, I'm not, I'm not putting anybody down for doing those things, but it, if you're not happy doing that, then what are you doing? You're, you know, you're not making any effort to further your career. Why not jump into something? You know, it's perfect time. Perfect time. Like, everybody's doing whatever they want now. A lot of things getting made right now. Yeah. Well, it's not just that. It's uh, the proliferation of, of technologies made it so that you can make your own movie. You can make your own podcast. You can do your own. I'm not going to fuck TikTok. TikTok. But anyways, you're not even going to start on that <laughs> shit. But, uh, you know. You saw my skits. They're fucking dumb <laughs> as fuck. But they're funny. They're funny. I give it up. My boy's got some chops. Uh, but when it comes down to it, like, these these efforts you got to make towards the career in the film industry doesn't necessarily need to be. You might start out in a, I want to be a director. Or yeah. I want to be a DP. I want to be, you know, no, no one starts out saying I want to be a PA. You know, but PAs, you know, oftentimes are your future boss. I've heard that a lot. My first set, I was a PA. And then uh, the dudes that I were, was working on that set with, like, a year later, I hired them all as a director. <laughs> <laughs> a year. One year. Yeah, and it happens. It happens, bro. You know, I've I've had I've had PAs from previous shoots that I maintain a good relationship with, you know, professionally and like outside of work, and they call me, you know, now that they're producing or directing or production manager or, you know, those guys, they come up, you know, and treating. That's another the number. What were you at? Number three. Four, four. Think, well, something. number three, four One of those. is treat your PAs well. For Christ fucking sake, these guys get treated like slaves. Like it's bad. Like hate when I see someone treat a PA bad because they're learning. You know, they are learning. Yeah, and, and you know. it's the same with anything in our industry. A PA could be anybody. Like I've seen how many young grips these days start out with almost no knowledge because the grip you know uh culture is getting to a point to where there's not enough experienced people involved and that's one of those like one of those weird things where you almost like the airline industry there's not enough vietnam era vets that used to fly that can uh fill the airplane pilot position so now we have a bunch of layoffs or not layoffs but uh delays and flights and stuff like that because there's just not enough of those people and it's the same in the film industry the film industry is so close knit that there's there's a giant gap that's that's about to happen for a lot of people you know because they're retiring and it really happened during 2020 there, a big big there was a huge a huge like retirees. uh yeah, the the guys that were in our industry, you know, 80s, 90s, to early 2000s, they worked their 30 years and put in a little extra. You know, the I know guys that were working stuff way back in the 90s and they're still working today, you know. And they basically hit 2020 and they're like, I'm out. So that vacuum is got a huge void to fill now like there, there's so many openings for qualified key grips that it's it's crazy you know and and like a, a lot of those dudes that end up retiring are they like most a lot of them like union guys and stuff or i mean yeah a lot of them are union guys but a lot of them are just you know it, it does you don't have to be union to do this that's a, a, you know number five you don't have to be union to do this uh, that's a, that's a, a misnomer that if you don't go union, you won't get big shows. Because yeah, that that is definitely 
a prevalent sentiment in the game. If you're yep. not DGA, if you're not PGA, if you're not You fucking, won't do big stuff. Um, I see, you know. I I do commercials for Toyota, Ford, Yokohama, Harley. Uh, uh, I've shot a B-roll for Spider-Man Far From Home. I've worked on things that are, are, are giant budgets that, you know, we did uh, an $11 million Megan Thee Stallion uh, a VR video. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah, where we lifted 13,000 pounds and 102 sky panels. 102 sky panels. So if you and don't there's know, a lot more. <laughs> if you don't know what a sky panel is, um, actually, y'all could just Google this or you could look this shit up on IG. But sky panels, 102 of them, it's kind of, it's easy to just say the word, but when you see it, when you see it in a picture or on a video, then you're like, holy fuck. Because it wasn't just 102 sky panels. No, the, you know, we had uh, 360s, S360s, which are also sky panels. They're just four times the size. We had two of those guys up there. We had uh, also six more uh, 1K pill lights or balloon lights that were up there. And then, you know, they had, uh, I don't even know how many, they had two 24 par dinos on each side which are basically stadium lights behind a silk and then four s uh 120s uh, uh, in front of each one of those so and why did you need so much light oh well it's because you're, you're, you're shooting for vr everything's got to be in focus like you don't want something to fall out of focus when you're shooting on a green screen you want everything to be in focus that way the person rendering it has the ability to capture as much data as possible. I wanted to talk about how there are some do's and some don'ts. Yeah. There's some do's and some don'ts on set. And I think one of the biggest don'ts is don't get angry. You know, yeah. uh, you see a lot of people lose their temper and people will lose their respect for you almost immediately. You know, uh, and, and and that's really hard to regain that respect again when you lose your temper. You might get mad, but there's always a way to handle what's happening on set in a diplomatic way, uh, a legal way, or even even when something's like not safe. I never get angry about when shit's not safe on set. You know, I am very plain and to the point. I try to just play that role that like, hey, I'm just doing my job. You know, I'm here to make sure that nobody dies today. You know, like you said, the key grips in charge of safety, man. Like safety. I'm safety there first. to make sure nobody dies. And that's it's one of the hardest roles to play is somebody to walk up and say, we can't do this. And you're gonna get a lot of flack for that. You know, if you think it's not safe, it's not safe. You know, if you don't feel it's safe, have them demonstrate that it is safe. You know, have them show you. And then once they show you it's safe, it's, it's much like uh, a key grip clearing a weapon, which uh, the key grip is 100% responsible for what happened on Rust, uh, just as much as the armor, just as much as the first AD, just as much as Alec Baldwin. Everybody in that situation had an opportunity to check that weapon and did not there is a major safety flaw there that happened there, there's a major bro yeah like it, it, it st there were so many chances every one so of those people chances. i named every single one of those positions i named and alec baldwin had an opportunity and it are supposed to check the weapon before it's used on a set like period and it's one of the first things any me or my boys will do. If we see a weapon on set, we walk right over to them and we go, I need to clear that and make sure there's no live fire in there. And if there is live fire in there, I need to make sure that it's being held and maintained by the right person. You know, and that everybody on set knows that there's a live fire weapon on set. You know, we have, you, you got it too. We, have, we, we both have the same tattoo because of a firing situation that happened on set where a crew member was asked to clear a weapon who wasn't qualified to do it. And subsequently it went off and nobody got injured, but it was dangerous for everybody on set. 
you know, we, we took it for the person who was asking was very green or not the person asking, but the person asked was very green and it just didn't know, you know, and volunteered to do it. And the person who asked him to do it didn't know that he didn't know. He just thought he was in grip department and he was qualified to do that job. So, I mean, and that we ended up firing the armorer. Yeah. Because of I 100 percent like that. That wasn't the only one. Again, that that's one of those don't get angry, but know when to stand your ground and walk up to whoever's in charge, and you'll know who that is. Especially when that kind of shit happens, you walk up to him and you tell him like we found out that the armor had messed up and the armor had left a live weapon on set and walked away, didn't tell anybody. And the first AD just saw a live weapon on, or a weapon on set, and wasn't sure if it was clear or not, and asked a grip department member to clear it for him, which is standard, you know. And and that was 100%. The AD was doing his job, making sure that the weapon was clear, but he just didn't know that the person he was asking to do wasn't qualified. Right, and that same armor was a little old school, I guess. Uh, yeah, we uh, we called him Walter White because he's a little just, he's a little just know nuts. that. <laughs> um, there, one time he we had like a it's kind of like a misfire situation. Uh, oh like yes, it, it jammed or it, it, it wouldn't shoot, and he takes the weapon, and we're all kind of like, you know, the director's giving notes, and we're all kind of resetting into our positions and. And without telling anybody, this man fires it at the ground. Yep. It's like, granted, yeah, it was at the ground, but he gave no warning, and everybody, like, you know, nobody, nobody knew, <laughs> nobody, nobody knew, knew that was going to happen. So there was a couple instances like that, and so we eventually had to fire him. Yeah, and then we I brought on another guy that was extremely competent. Yeah. In his position. Yeah. Well, he was an off-duty officer. Right. You know, that, which was perfect. That that uh, made everybody feel real safe. Way, way but, more safe. But uh, yeah, I, I had to stand my ground on that one with the producer, and I walked up and I told him, I said, if that, we, it was a Friday when we had the desk pop happen, and uh, that's when I I walked up and I said, hey man, if he's on set on Monday, my crew's not on set. And he was immediately fired, and they rehired somebody else. You know, it was over safety. Don't be afraid to tell producers you're gonna walk because of safety. You know, it's not worth your life. Not at all. No. I mean, a lot of times you might be on a set and like it feels like life or death, and the producers and the and the director and like the EPs even are making it seem as though it's life or death. Yeah, but, but it's not. We're we're making movies, bro. Like we're we're make we're shooting a music video. Like I said you know, in the we're beginning, sh- we're, it's not. This shit is not life or death by any means. Mm. Yeah, like I said in the beginning, it was, uh, I don't care if you get your shot done. You know, I'm there to make money, and that's another thing you need to learn, uh, probably lesson number seven, is uh, I'm giving you a piece of time that I will never get back from my life. Like, I'm offering you time for a paper substitute, you know, so I could just maintain living. And when people mess around with your money, get that money. Don't get that money. <laughs> I don't mess around with money. <laughs> Not at all. That's why they call me the salty grip number two. Because <laughs> like, uh, I'm i known for getting my boys paid. Because producers will dick you around. Absolutely will. Absolutely will dick you around. Um, we were on a shoot. It was this year. And we're on, we're on a shoot this year, and uh, it took, which, you know, Jason knows all of the uh, all of the laws and shit in place for this to prevent this from happening, but we were on a shoot, we wrapped, it, we were supposed to get paid the, the following week, um, invoices, invoices got sent in, the whole nine, everything was taken care of. And then 45 days later, we finally got paid. And yep. it wasn't, it was, we didn't get paid until I hit up the client, which is a big, a big record label. And 
when you do that, you know, people are like weird about like you soiling the relationship and stuff like that. And so we had to hit up this big label and I'm like, yo, my casting director hasn't been paid. My uh, grip department hasn't been paid. My, my DP, nobody, like all these motherfuckers just didn't get paid, including myself. Yeah. And they all hit me up because I was a PM. And so I was fighting to get their money, but they just drag their feet and drag their feet and drag their feet. And I don't know if it's about a balance sheet or if it's like about like them just being slow or sometimes they just don't follow the law flow problems or what I, I don't know the reason i always say it this way would you have the plumber come over to fix your toilet and then at the end go i'll pay you in 30 days yeah no nah, i don't think so i did my job pay me <laughs> right pay me and that's yeah. another thing that's another thing that i learned about this business bro is like be proactive about getting your fucking money. Be I don't offer proactive. financing. Yeah, bro. Be yeah. proactive. Like, get, hit up that producer. Blow up his phone. Send emails. Fucking leave voicemails. Send texts. Be, be on that shit. On it, but also don't get angry. Stay cool. Stay cool. Use the law. Know the law. That's, that's tip number eight. Know the law. You know, when you know when you're supposed to get paid, how you're supposed to get paid, how you're supposed to get treated, you have power. And when you can reference something, they have no power. You might hear, oh, well, this is industry standard. Industry standard doesn't mean you can sidestep laws. Yeah, and they try to tell you shit, like, like especially if you're green, they try to tell you shit, like, in, they use words like industry standard to make you feel like oh maybe i don't know what the fuck i'm talking yeah. about you know, yeah yeah exactly you feel all like insecure about what your knowledge is you know yeah yep it's it's one of those things that they will try to lord over you and you know do you if you're green and you don't know you're gonna get caught up in some stupid stuff but learn from it you know never say no to a job that you might meet somebody you know unless it's a really bad rate don't do that <laughs> every every shoot is a learning experience I've found. Yeah. Especially being a director. One thing about what I've noticed and it's something that like I, I, I saw in the Sam Jackson masterclass. The dude says typically the director that comes on set and he's Mr. Fucking Badass and, and thinks he knows everything, those directors and most directors have spent the least amount of time on on a set. On a set, On yeah. a film set. They don't know how to light it. They don't know where really a camera should go. They're, they're, they lean heavily on the DP, and the right. DP leans heavily on grip and electric and art department. Right. You know? That's that's one of those things where they lean, uh, they call it a, above the line is essentially like everybody in the 1%, you know? They're making money. They, they own the company. They're producing a product. But ultimately, you're doing the hard work in order to make them look good. Right. When I, the first time I heard that above the line term, I thought it was interesting. I thought it was an interesting phrase, if you will, because it's like it kind of it kind of makes it sound like this, like I'm above you, this this weird hierarchy of shit. And like the DP is like on the line I mean it, it is like it, I mean it has to be EPs, you, you I, have to follow the hierarchy because if you don't it's total chaos absolutely you the know hierarchy's there for a reason it's there for I, a I reason I always just thought that the term was kind of weird because it's like it, it, I feel like some people can let that shit go to their head I mean above the line really refers to people I feel like that put in a lot more effort to get the shoot done to a point you know it's not always true but there are shoots where it's months leading up to the day of the shoot where these people have been putting in hours and hours and hours and days and months of getting to actual shoot day, you know? And yeah, they've, they, they've towed the line to where it is. And, and so everybody below that is stepping in basically halfway through the project or at the end of the project because even when it's wrapped, 
project's not over. There's more shit to be done. Director still has Absolutely. to keep going. DP still has to keep doing. He might have to do B-roll. He might have to do pickups. He's got to sit there with the colorist. Director's got to sit there with the editor. Like, there's a lot to do even after a shot is done. So everybody who thinks that they're important because, you know, hey, man, I'm a key grip. The shot doesn't happen unless I'm there. You know, Gaffer, if he's not there, shot's not going to happen. You know, the, you, you got no light. What are you going to shoot? You know, you're blown out. What are you going to shoot? Like, it, it's it's way too bright here. Or it looks like crap. Like, our job is to help you make it look good. But ultimately, I'm not doing nearly as much work as the people above the line. You know, they, they may seem a lot of times like they're unaware. And that's the other thing. People kind of give directors and DPs uh, a lot of shit for their attitude. But I hate to say it this way. You gotta realize the stress that these men go through. Not just men, women. Or, or I'm not. No pronouns. No pronouns. My bad. Um, th- these people go through in order to uh, get a shot done. You know, because there's there's so much in in that working pattern that like a PA or a grip, just a normal grip, not the key grip. Key grip generally has a little bit of insight of what's going on. Gaffer has a little bit of insight of what's going on. Definitely not putting in the hours. You know what I mean? Like, I try to do as little work as possible. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I have a long day on set and we're like, say, we're shooting a lot of pages and uh, we got a lot of setups and we got fuck it, and, you know, all this shit going on. It, it's about hour twelve, hour thirteen that I literally start getting decision fatigue yeah like i've made so many decisions and i've fielded literally hundreds if not a couple thousand questions you start to like it literally you know you're like slower and like it's harder to even decide Mm -hmm. like after a long day you're like i don't even want to pick what i am gonna eat well and and yeah and that, that that goes for uh for a lot of shit on set, I mean, you, you get to a fatigue. I, I don't agree with a 12-hour day unless it's a one-day shoot. You know, you're doing 12-hour days five days in a row. That that That's hard. It's real hard. Cause it it kind of, like, starts to cut into the quality. By, by day five, you are done. And your two-day weekend isn't a weekend. It's you sleeping the first day and then you trying to figure out how to do your laundry and maybe go out and get something to eat that you don't want to go out and do anything so you just postmates instead because you don't want to leave the fucking right, house right and that's literally your weekend was you sleeping and postmating and you maybe did laundry if you weren't that lazy <laughs> right so i mean and that that's reality for a lot of filmmakers is like on the weekends that, that that's just enough time for you to sleep and the worst is overnight shifts like when you do that uh, Friday night, the Friday night, where it's Friday into Saturday, and they're like, "Yeah, we're doing an overnight tonight, guys." You know, we're gonna start out at six a uh, six p.m. on Friday, and we wrap at six a.m. on Saturday. But guess what? Monday we're going back to eight a.m. So did you really get two days off? Fuck no, you didn't. That's why fuck Friday. Fuck Friday. Find somebody to fill in for you that day. <laughs> Pro tip. <laughs> well, uh, and it, we should uh, touch on some location stuff. I mean, we haven't talked yeah, about any location. Let's wrap yet. up. Yeah, let's wrap with, up with, with some with, location uh, shit. Figuring out like one of my favorite things in in doing this is being able to go to our locations. I mean, bro, we're just sitting here in this nice location right now doing this, and this is just you know, you know, amateur podcasting. This isn't anything big. I've been to some of the biggest mansions and the most crazy places you've ever been to. So look forward to that shit, man. Like you might go to fun. Yeah, you might go to Fiji. You might be in a billionaire's office, like looking at Jackson Pollocks that are one of a kind. I've done that. Fire. Like, bro, there there are places where you you might drive a Lamborghini because they need the Lamborghini moved over there or whatever and you might get to see some stuff that nobody else gets to see or go somewhere no one else gets to go here are interviews that are you get to hear first and you're like oh my shit like I want to share this with everybody but you can't 
because he's got an NDA. And like being on location also comes with a lot of other shit that happens, which means you're gonna have to deal with heat, you're gonna have to deal with cold, you're gonna have to deal with humidity, and people start getting generally frustrated on location. And planes and planes, and yeah, sirens and children. But being on location doesn't always mean you're in a studio, doesn't always mean you're in a house, doesn't always mean you're in the best, but you're where the shot needs to be. And always be prepared. I always bring a set of, an extra set of pants, a set of shorts, a long sleeve shirt, sunscreen, deodorant. My, I bring fingernail clippers just because, like, I don't know how long I'm gonna be there, man. Like, yeah, yeah, bro. <laughs> I have everything in, in, a, in a go bag on set stuff for rain i have waterproof socks just in case it starts raining out of nowhere because you never know monsoon hits bow you don't want your feet being wet all day that is miserable fucking miserable and that as as filmmakers bro we, we are in every element we're yeah. in sun we're in we're in darkness we're in snow we're in rain we're in fucking cold as fuck yep. kansas city be prepared for <laughs> be a boy scout be prepared for anything. Have that headlamp. Have that chapstick. Have that extra pack of cigarettes if you smoke. Have an extra vape if you vape. Have extra weed if you smoke weed. Like, bro, you don't know how long you're going to be there. Like, be ready for basically any kind of shit that's going to happen during the day. And then some. And also, you know, if you're a generous person, bring a little extra. You never know. Somebody bring might need some help. a little extra help. for your homies. Yeah, someone might need a little extra help while you're there. Like, I've, I've done it several times where somebody needs a, a hand. Like, they're, they're hurting from whatever. Like, I have aspirin with me. I bring salt tablets. Have salt tablets. Make sure you take salt tablets when it's hot outside and you're drinking lots of water. You're like, oh, salt's bad for you. No, you need salt. Electrolytes. Yeah, electrolytes. I don't think that that's gun- those are gunshots in the background, but... Ah, it sounds like fireworks. It sounds like fireworks. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to L.A. <laughs> it's way after 4th of July. I can't believe that. But, I mean, on on, on that note, <laughs> like, sound is going to be your worst enemy sometimes. That fool is going to be right where you want to put your stand. That fool is going to be right where you want to do your shit. Like, every goddamn time he's going to go, is my boom in the way? Yes, your boom's in the goddamn way, sir. But sound, it's like you can't, you know, a lot of productions, they'll try to cut corners on this or that and third and blah, blah, blah. It's like, see, as as the plane flies (laughs) by, you can't fuck with sound. No. And, and you know what? There, I always say this. so important. There's, there's sound. Sound needs to happen. And, like, everybody, like, when you're in the middle of a take with sound, everybody everybody who makes, like, the smallest rustling noise, everybody goes, what the Looks fuck? Looks at him. Yeah, there's dead stare. Yeah. Dead stare. Like, you're straight to the face. You're like, I just moved my chair a little bit, man. I, my bad. Or you, like, move your Apple box shifts a little bit. And you're like, Ur. you're like, oh, no, I didn't mean to destroy the... the this. Yeah, when I'm directing, I got the cans on, and I like I hear like just the lightest like conversation off in the background, and I'm like, turn around, and, <laughs> and everybody else turns around, and they look, and it's just like this one guy or two guys are like, oh shit, my bad. Like, <laughs> I, I I've known a couple sound guys that are really good. I've known a lot of sound guys that are really freaking weird. I always say this: there's two kinds of sound guys. There's that really cool sound guy. That'll go get a tattoo with you. And yeah, there's, Jacob. That, there's that other sound guy that uh, I wouldn't give him the keys to my fucking Pinto to fucking drive that around the corner because that fool is the sketchiest fucker, like, you've ever met. Like, you know what I mean? I've met a couple weird ones. Yeah. That's for sure. They can it's, get... f- it's funny that that's, like, the, the, the conception <laughs> because it's like, yeah, no, it's true. It's fucking true. Yeah. Like, there, there, there's some, you'll meet some weird people out there. Just, again, lesson number one, be genuine, don't be fake, be a real guy. Like, you go far in this industry if you're just happy being here. And I think out of everything we talked about, that's the most important. Yeah. I think that's a good thing to, I think that's a good thing to end on. Be fucking genuine. Be likable. You know what I'm saying? Like, be, be authentic. Be, know be know where you're working. Yeah, bro. Like, you're, you're working in one of the uh, an industry that people all over the world strive to work in. Like, be happy. Don't be angry. 
I love it. Jason Rowan, Purple Gems, Purple Couch, coming oh at you live and direct from Los Angeles, California. We out. Peace.